and in today's video we're going to be talking about uh, preventing and treating gar vegetable garden pests because you know what it's like you can grow those perfect looking vegetables and then the next day everything is just decimated by you know cabbage white uh, caterpillars or something like that so what we're going to do today if you look in the chat if you're on youtube um there is going to be a, a live chat top chat and there's a question chat you can drop questions in there if you want to otherwise if you put a question in the normal chat put a capital q and i will be able to uh, find it in there but bear in mind the ones that you put in the questions when i won't be able to drag onto screen okay now we've got a guest today uh, Danny, some of you will know him, some of you won't, and he is going to be here answering a lot of your questions as well. And Danny's been having some really good results on his garden. So, um, without any further ado, I'm going to bring Danny in. Hey, Danny, how are you doing? Are you right? Good. Yeah, I'm good, mate. I'm good. Um, for those of you, um, those that don't know you, mate, um, why don't you introduce yourself? Tell them a little bit about yourself and what you're up to, and uh, and I'll make sure the links are available for people. Anybody yeah, who sure. hasn't seen it, the links are in the description as well. So I'm Danny, and I have the Grapevine Garden channel on YouTube, and I normally work on a no-dig basis. I've got two plots, and one's got chickens, and it's more like a food factory, and the other one's going to be more of a perennial plot. So, yeah, um, I'm learning and growing as I go along, so, yeah. Okay, great. So we're going to be talking today about uh, preventing <clears throat> pests and uh, treating them once you do get them. And uh, we'll be checking out the chat as we go. I'm going to say hello to a few people while we're here, for those who have come in nice and early. And then, uh, I don't know if you can see the chat at the moment, Danny. Um, yeah, I can, yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. So um, we'll go through and have a quick look and just welcome some of the people in. So we've got Amelia, Paul, Graham, Alan, Rob, uh, Rosen, hi Ru, uh, Coastal uh, Crocus, uh, and I think, oh, and Michael is in as well. So uh, Taffy is also in. So thanks for joining us, guys. I know we're chopping at days around all the time because of everything that's going on, but um, it's because I my shift pattern I work four on, four off. Um, before we get going, what I will say is that... The next live stream is going to be on the 29th of December, not next week, because I'm going to have a week off and uh, allow everybody just to have their sort of holiday uh, to themselves without worrying about me streaming. So, um, Danny, have you been plagued with anything this year? Um, yes. Um, I think a lot of people all over social media have seen like they have been played with white fly this year. And I think it's because of the, a lot of the dry sun that we've had. And yeah, I think it was, everyone was on the same situation where they were like, it was still hanging on and hanging on. I think it's only now we've had this frost that's finally knocked it on the head, but it was such a long season for them this year, I think. Yeah. It's been really mild this year, haven't it? You know, oh. for so long. And and now yeah. it's cold. It's cold, like you know. It's oh. but to be honest with you, we need this cold. I think it's going to do us a big favor. Yeah. All these, you know, for the last few years we've been quite mild here, and it's allowed the pests and things to build because the the winter wasn't knocking them back. But yeah. now we're having this cold spell. I think it'll do us a you know a yeah. a, a, a good turn, like you know. Um, so I'm just going to go through a couple of things here. Uh, so. Matty is saying that he's finally caught you live, got an allotment two years ago, and just want to say you've been my go-to guy for all things growing and composting. Thank you, Matty. I really appreciate that. Um, it's funny, actually. I um, went to an instant on my last night shift, Danny, and we were oh. dealing with a cardiac arrest, and oh. one of the paramedics there was a viewer so uh, it was quite <laughs> I've had that in the, the hospital the, as well the boys the boys hate it because as soon as someone says oh we know you it was like oh here we go again <laughs> yeah <laughs> so exactly right okay so guys don't forget um put your questions in the chat okay uh, there is a questions page if you want to put them in there but we can't pull them directly into the chat otherwise 
put a queue in here and uh, and then we'll go from there. So our first question's in from uh, Karen. How do we get rid of leaf miner? Well, like I, this year has been my first year where I've been plagued and plagued with leaf miner as well. And I've tried, I tried every trick under the butt with leaf miner this year. And for some reason, I don't know if it's because of my season, they just kept coming back and back. And then I, I used a soapy, I used soapy solution in the end, and for some reason that that really knocked it back. And but I tried everything, and I think this this year coming now, I'm just going to move my alliums because I think they're just they're one of those things that are a bugbear, you know, that they either once they get in, they're in, and I tend to leave it a year or two then before I move them on. But yeah, I I tend to use like a soapy solution, or like I know there's other people use other. Um, non-organic methods but i don't tend to want to go down those roads i know neem oil is a big one that they like to use but i don't because it does knock off the bees and stuff as well so i, I tend to stay from them yeah i mean neem oil's okay depending on mm. what you're doing uh for those who are struggling with allium leaf miner and what have you i've just put a, a link in the description here all right, I've got a full blown article on that. Yeah. All right, I think it uh, explains all the different ways in which to deal with uh, leaf miner. And subsequently, guys, um, leaf miner can be an absolute pain oh. in the backside. Um, yeah. It's really difficult. A lot of people don't even know they've got it. And that's mm. the worst thing. But the secret with beating leaf miner is breaking that breeding cycle. Yeah. And if you can. If you can kill that breeding cycle, you're, you're much better. But um, hosing it off, like Danny was saying, is really good. Mm. Natural predators, things like that. You can buy in these uh, little powders now. You can shake all over your plants with little natural uh, predators in them. Um, yeah. And that will help. And what you shouldn't do is put any infected plants in your compost, all right? You need to destroy yeah, that, all right? And um, obviously there are insecticides and things, but companion planting can help as well with them. So it yeah. really depends on what you want with that. But check out that article. Um, that will help you. And I'm going to do that a fair bit today, guys, because one of the uh, first things I wrote when I started the website was a lot of the pest stuff, and it was to make life easier. So if we've got an article based on it, I'm going to throw it in the chat, and you can go and uh, read that as and when you go. Like um, my think... main... Go on. Yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, like my main thing is that I do with my leaf mine is that I always I just keep my annual alliums netted and that's, that, that seems to always be the, the main thing, but I left it too late this year. I normally keep them always, but on my other plot, I was okay because I never, never ever seemed to have Allium leaf minor issues. And when I moved further up the allotment, it was really strange because they were all telling me, oh, you will get it. And I, I ignored that because I never had it before, but I literally only moved up about 30, 40 foot up the plot. Completely yeah. different situation. And, and that's the thing, see, I mean, we all think, oh, well, I'm growing in the same area mm -hmm. as Danny or whatever the case being the, what you don't realize, even in like the same, like in the same couple of, you know, meter area, there are microclimates yeah. and what, what would be really a bad climate for Allium leaf miner 20 feet away is a really good climate yeah. all because of those um, things like, you know, so, um, you know, so it, it, you have to look at that and, and think about that, you know? Mm -hmm. um, right, let's have a little look what else we got here. I've just seen one from uh, Steve. So, Steve Digwell, I'm hoping the cold kills some pests, but I saw a slug with a scarf on today. <laughs> <laughs> you, you must have seen one of my live stream tests, right? <laughs> so, yeah. earlier on, Danny came came on to see me. Now, I've been in, in here since 8 o'clock this morning, and <laughs> unfortunately, one of my, my uh, kids came in yesterday and stepped on the lead for the radiator in here. And this, as you know, is in a in a garage, so it can get cold if if it's not heated. And uh, I came down here this morning. I was fully <laughs> dressed. I had a, a dressing gown on. I had my missus scarf on. I had a beanie hat on, <laughs> and and I and I and I've still got it here. A little blanket over my lap. I'm like an old grandma. Like, you know? I'm the same. So, oh. But um, 
you know, you would have thought he was like, in Alaska, honestly. <laughs> like the abominable snowman in you is mental. Um, right, okay. So, uh, so we've just got this one rats go in okay. the shed and green noses. So, this has come from Amelia. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the biggest thing for most people when they're building their sheds is they put it straight onto bare soil. So, it's an ideal place for rats to bury underneath. It keeps them away from predators and um, it provides that warmth for them now when i built my shed i didn't want that so i mm. put two feet of hardcore below me so there was no way a rat was getting no. into that um but there are things you can do if you actually lift the shed off the floor they don't like that draft that comes through no. and also predators can get under there so the likelihood is they wouldn't use that they go and find somebody else's shed so think about things like that yeah, like rats, rats are always going to be an issue. Like I think people think that you can sort that out completely and you never will. Like you'll never, ever get rid of that problem completely, but you can kind of knock it back or deter them from using your plot. Like I, you know, I, I've heard loads of little funny stories, you know, about using like ferret urine because they don't like that and um, peppermint. I know, I know they hate peppermint because I always plant that out of the back of my plot and there's no runs coming in from that. And yeah, I rats are the, one of those things that when they're in, they'll just keep coming, but you just keep making sure that they, do, you just don't give them anything they want. Remove food, remove water supplies. And yeah, yeah. that was easy. And that was a thing when I did the um, keeping rats out of the compost bay video, mm. I went <laughs> through all the different things showing about like rat runs and stuff there, because, you know, at the end of the day, um, you don't want to give him those hiding spaces no. and, and and that's when you need to clean it up. I mean, we don't want to clean the garden up to such an extent where it's sterile, but um, yeah, but it is like good they to hate, have. They hate movement as well. So just keep moving yeah. things around and stop having them little runs around the fence and stuff. Just move things around. Well, you've been to my garden. That is the exact yeah. reason why the compost bays are along that main road there, because yeah. that will prevent those coming in and be, becoming a pest because there's always movement along that road, you know? Yeah. So that's a, a, a good bit of advice for those of you who are struggling with uh, with that. So, um, Danny, um, with yeah. um, so you struggled <laughs> with with Allium. Um, yeah. Have you had any issues with things like cabbage white or anything this year? Uh, no, I didn't actually. Like I learned from the Allium that just I if anyone's seen my channel, they know that I keep mine netted at all times and. I hate it because I would love to live in an environment where you don't have no nets, we don't have to have hoops. But what I how I solved it was just making sure that the nets were nice looking and then the hoops were nice looking and it doesn't bother me as much now. But yeah, I didn't have any carrot cabbage white fly. I, I gotta be honest, touch word, I was okay because I netted them. As soon as I planted my cabbages, they were netted and I, I keep the netters on all through the winter and autumn. So no pests really or seeds can blow in as much. So yeah, it's it's one of those bug bears, but yeah, luckily I didn't have any this year, but I have in the past, and again, like soapy yeah. water, keep hosing them off, and yeah, but I know a lot of people this year they they were plagued by them as well, and but luckily I I tend to um, stay from them a bit. Okay, but we've got so go on. We've got loads of budlier. Um, all around the one side of the plot. And for some reason, I hated the idea when they first planted it because caterpillars, you know, they love it, don't they? But they seem to keep attracting Stick towards to that. that rather than my plot, so I'm okay. Yeah, okay. So Christy has asked, uh, or Christy grows, how do you deal with flea beetles? They're like a swarm of locusts this year on her brassicas. Oh, so I know, I again... So flea beetles, yeah, they're another thing that, as much as they do make your crops look horrible, they don't actually affect anything apart from the look, really. Like, I have it on my Swedes a lot. Like, I get a lot of flea beetle on my Swede, and it doesn't. It never affects the growth or anything like that. It's, it's more the leaf, you know, the leaf part of the, the crop. But, yeah, I've had it on pak choy as well, and my greatest tip for that is, like, I raise it up off the ground. Like, I grow my pak choy in my greenhouse, through autumn in hanging baskets and that has been a massive success for the last couple of years and I've seen other people all over social media that have taken on that tip and yeah I keep them off the ground as high as it can because 
for some yeah. reason that really works. But flea beetle, oh god, they're another thing that are an absolute nightmare. Yeah, another good thing for flea beetles is yellow sticky traps because yeah. they're attracted to yellow. And for again, uh, for for you, there is a post I've just put into the chat there. Uh, all about flea beetle identification and how to uh, deal with any outbreaks and things yeah. like that. So that would like you can get ne like the nematodes from as well, and like yeah. again neem oil. But it's that debate with the neem oil, so I tend to not. But other people yeah. will use it. But yeah, I'll never suggest it. But I get that there is a a use for it sometimes. But I never would use neem oil on like flowers and stuff because I know bees obviously attract them more. But yeah, yeah neem oil does work amazing for it as well. So Angela Anderson is uh, asking or saying that she's given up on zucchini because of squash bugs. Help. So um, what oh, do you know you'll have to answer that bugs? because I've never had any issues with squash. I didn't even know what there was a squash bug. Yeah, they, they, they go by so many different names these days. But um, the, the thing about squash bugs is they're big enough that you can handpick them. And mm. that's probably one of the better ways. Uh, if you're having major issues with them, hosing them off doesn't really work because they just climb back onto the plant. Um, but diatomaceous earth is really good for them. So if you put some diatomaceous earth around the um, around the courgettes or your zucchinis, uh, put some of that around. And there's a food grade version that you can get, which is very fine. It's a different type of uh, diatomaceous earth, okay? So you, there's two different types, and the one is really aggressive, even for, like, your normal animals, like your yeah. birds and your cats and things. You don't want to be using that. But there's a fine food-safe grade, and if you use that one, um, then that's just basically going to nick the exoskeleton in them. It dehydrates them, and they tend to die from that. So yeah. um, that will really help with squash bugs. But you can pick them off. It is a pain, and if you've got a real bad infestation, um, it's a lot of work. Sometimes it's just not worth it with the plant, but mm. um, it tends to, to to they tend to sort of be attracted to the cubit family. So um, if uh, you know your sort of squashes, melons, uh, pumpkins, courgettes, uh, zucchinis, you know all those sort of things, the marrows. Um, but um, Another thing that they don't like is a lot, and it it can actually help you as well with things like um, uh, powdery mildew. Is whole milk? If you spray yeah. a watered down version of whole milk onto your plants as they're growing, um, squash bugs don't like it for some reason. So that may be something worth having a look at. Um, Angela saying she doesn't see the Allium leaf miner article. Um, for some reason, Angela, bear with me one second. I am losing. I'm in the chat now, but I did I, see it on I, there though. Yeah, it is in there, but for some reason, I've got a cross against. Let me um, pull it up. Uh, Instagram. There. Yeah, that's the link there. But for some reason, um, when I when I try posting it. It's um, coming up with a YouTube icon with a cross through it. So I don't know whether YouTube are having any issues with the um, with the messaging system at the moment. But what I'll do then, guys, um, when I post these links into the chat, I'll also put them onto screen. So if you get a pen or whatever or take a photo of it, you can literally just type it into the address bar. So that should have been on long enough for you. If not, just go into the website. Link is in the description below and just type in Leaf Miner into the search bar of the website and it'll pull it up for you, okay? Um, and while we're at it then, Danny, I might as well pull all these links in go as well on. because um, this is Danny's Instagram um, only because I don't know if people are getting them because I'm getting crosses on all the YouTube stuff. This one is Danny's um YouTube channel, Hello. guys, and that's at the Grapevine Garden. And this one is the flea beetle identification one, okay? So 
like I said, guys, everything we're doing here, the other thing you could do is go to the website, click on blog and go to pest and disease. And then you can be able to scroll through all the pest and disease articles yeah. that I have, which will like probably I, be easy I've only way. ever had problems with my squashes and things like I this year I had ants for some reason, like ants were really they're focusing on my courgettes and and the pumpkin on the bottom. I only end up having two pumpkins from my whole plot because ants were just really taking over and the thing that i loved the most that i found that this year doing is like i was mixing water cinnamon and an actual orange and i blended all up and made a nice paste and i put that around it like a nice ring about two or three inches and that stopped them they just they hated that cinnamon I was just gonna say, they don't like cinnamon and Absolutely um, uh, again another uh thing like I've, I've said to loads of people with cinnamon with ants but if you're getting ants around there all the time, the, the likelihood is the plant isn't getting enough water either because yeah. they, they don't like damp areas. But no. um, if they're just looking to feed, then, yeah, they'll still come. But the I cinnamon will stop them this in year, though, because of all the sun, didn't they? Like, we was just dry yeah. for so many months and, yeah, yeah everything. And, and that's the going. danger, isn't it? You know? Yeah. That's the danger. Let's have a look if we've got any other questions here. So, um Let's have a look where we are. Let me just delete some of these questions, guys, so I, I know where I am with them. Uh, that's done. Squash bugs is done. Right. So someone's telling me the wife's very sad. What can they do about it? Get them in the garden. That will help them. <laughs> <laughs> um, Angela, we've dealt with. Let's move that one. Right. Uh, Adam Heath. Hi, guys. I really suffered with grey aphids on my cabbages this year. They were smothered in them. Any tips on avoiding uh, them on netted crops? Aphids. Yeah, again, so like soapy water, I use that. And that just, that tends to bind them more. So it stops them from working more than anything. And so it doesn't really, um, like it will deter them, obviously, but it's more about binding them up and stopping them from carrying on, destroying your, your, you know, your crops. But that's the downside of nets is that once they're in, if you've got a net over, you're causing, you're creating a habitat there where pests can't come in to kill the aphids, you know, like ladybirds and things like that, because you've got the nets on. So it's one of those issues in it. Like I, I this year I tried deterring things from my crops. Like I had problems last year with black fly on my runner beans. So I, you know, I planted nasturtiums and all further away from them. They they preferred that. But once they're in, that's the thing. If you've got them netted, there's the pluses of it, but you can also cause it where you're you're protecting them as well so they can carry on breeding and eating. So yeah, I just soapy water them again. Yeah. And again and sticky traps as well, they work as well. Sticky traps, yeah. So again, there is another article there on getting rid of aphids off your plants. Um, this, look, guys, I think there's one big thing that a lot of people tend to miss out to is the fact that um, they strip their gardens bare of things like stingy nettles and what have you. And mm -hmm. those stingy nettles are what things like ladybirds, lace wings yeah. and things like that which are all the predatory insects they require those to breed and what we find is we'll see a small uh, outbreak of something like aphids in the garden and we get all panicky and we're like right okay i've got to do this that and the other it's when people start reaching for the chemicals because they're worried it's going to go out of hand yeah but it takes a little while for the um predatory insects to come in and breed enough in order yeah. to take control of it but they 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 will or you can implement uh and introduce uh, some predatory insects you know you can buy them now in a clay or or, or some of them are now in like these little sachets you sprinkle everywhere yeah. you know i mean things like that but lace wings and ladybirds they'll just massacre you know a massive um outbreak of aphids in in a matter of days you know they you know you see them like literally it's like lunchtime for them. It's just picking them up and, you know, and eating them like, you know, it's mental. Yeah, I think, like, we we instantly think, like, attack, kill all the pests straight away. And, like, I think the, the first line of defense should be to be patient, really, and, like, and wait. Because sometimes we we tackle this pest and then we're also not feeding the good pests. And we're also eradicating the good pests as well. And, like, you know, like, planting, like, bor I plant borage and stuff because, you know, parasitic wasps, wasps come in and 
they're brilliant as well for you know like knocking off pests but if we keep knocking off everything we're stopping that circle of you know of pest life really so yeah you can actually do more damage than yeah you have it look it, it's a fine balance for sure yeah. and um and and i i'm with you on this i think sometimes I mean, we all make things like, you know, I've got articles on most things. I've got videos on a lot of stuff um, about getting rid of them. But sometimes, and, and like, for example, slugs, right? We yeah. all hate slugs in the garden, right? They destroy everything. But I'm in the process of making a video about slugs and why you shouldn't destroy them. Because there's oh. this certain slug uh, called a leopard slug. Yeah. Now, leopard slug feeds on other slugs, mm -hmm. but yet because of the way we we want to eradicate slugs we're killing those as well so yeah. it, you know sometimes you just really gotta take a step back and think right am i doing the right thing here by eradicating this pest you know so coastal crocus is having trouble with carrot rust uh carrot root fly i'm assuming that is uh, is there anything they can do other than going without planting for this season and <laughs> starve them out are they likely overwintering in the soil so covering with a net or something like that what 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 would you say there so like i i always plant my carrots up high um about 18 inches up in the ground you know you that's the benefit of having raised beds really is that you have got that extra height but Again, you can net, but I tend to plant my, I I actually did a video, um, it's coming out now for the spring, and that was all about using that space on top of your IBC tank, because you've got that extra space on the top, and it's, the, it's you know, it's way above where you can just store your, you know, grow your carrots and stuff there, and yeah, it's it's just one of those things, again, it is another, you can, you know, have like the resistor fly and fly away carrot seeds, but I've grown them as well, and I've I sadly found that they weren't as as tasty as the ones yeah. that were, you know, organically grown. So I just yeah, there always I, seems to be a trade off, doesn't it? You there's know? a trade off yeah. with it because you think, oh, that's perfect. You know, the flies don't like them, but I actually didn't like them as well. So I just tend to keep them at net them, and yeah, you can also, you know, um, grow other plants around like onions and stuff, and that'll deter the smell a bit as well. But yeah, they're another pest that. Yeah. So carrot fly, guys, uh, I would have said the exact same things. Get them mm. into a raised bed, um, which was why I built the, the two raised beds, one full of sand. Yeah. They were built two feet high for a reason, because at that point, um, carrot fly flows relatively low to the ground. Um, you can use EnviroMesh, which yeah. is like very, very fine mesh. Uh, that will also stop them. Again, you could use things like uh, resistor fly and and what have you, uh, mm -hmm. seed. However, like you said, there is issues with with the taste and stuff. You know? Yeah, it's just so was it was in there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, what I will say is one thing that you can do that will really help yourself is when you're sowing your carrots, sow them really finely. Take the time to sow them fine, fine, because when you are thinning out that's when you're attracting the carrot root fly because yeah, they can exactly. smell those carrots that you're pulling those those little seedlings you're pulling out is what's attracting them so sow them really thinly and and get them up high and you'll be fine yeah okay. i also if i'm gonna thin i tend to do it in the evening time rather the rather than the morning time because yeah less flies then when it's darker and yeah i find that better as well but when you're doing it early morning and lunchtime that's just they they're waiting they're waiting for that smell yeah so humble servant is saying that uh, they've issue had issues with squash bugs as well uh neem doesn't do much no it doesn't uh jadam mm. i i wouldn't um i can't say about jadam because i haven't tried it uh for squash bugs because i don't suffer with them um no. but um but uh, I, I would probably stick to something like Jadam will probably may even work, but try it. You know, you've got nothing to lose. The other thing, like I said, is go back to the DE. I, I've never had a problem with, um, you know, with recommending DE to people. And they, they've come back and said it's dealt with it for them. Yeah. So, um, right. Okay. Let's have a look. What else we got here? Uh, remove. Um Right, Steve Digwell, any tips on stopping vine weevil? Yeah, come on, give me some as well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God, you a lot are literally interrogating me tonight. 
Why? <laughs> yeah, again, <laughs> nematodes. I use nematodes for everything. But they're another thing that just I didn't have any problem with this year. But last year, oh god, they decimated so many of my, you know, my crops. And again, just keep an eye on when you're taking out your pots and stuff. And and normally I find I have trouble with them with my strawberries when I when I take my strawberries and I overwinter in the greenhouse. Always check through those plants when you take them back out because they try to sneak in there and they hide in those pots over winter and stuff. But yeah, I tend to use nematodes for those because I cannot. They're just one of those things that once they get get on my plot, I haven't got them on my new plot, so I'm okay. But the year before, oh, it was, it was honestly it was horrific. Yeah, and uh, you know nematodes if you can get them because they mm. haven't been that easy to get lately. Um, they are a natural predator they're in the soil already we are just bolstering the numbers now a lot of people are frightened yeah. of the word nematode because they think that the nematodes are going to start eating all the roots of their plants and everything mm -hmm. else and there are nematodes that will do that okay but what we are talking about you now um in my book composting masterclass i talk quite a bit about nematodes there's mm. four groups of nematodes okay and uh we're talking about one specific group out of the four here yeah. uh, which are used as a, a destroyer of pests you know so nematodes they literally go and they will inject they just uh, eat they, from you it's yeah, horrific they, but... it, it is if you actually if, if we could expand that up to our size it would be disastrous seeing something yeah. like this like you know but it is life you know so um yeah so yeah i i would agree with you nematodes on that um right I, for some reason i'm not going the chat now i don't know why so i'm just gonna click it no on i one. haven't had any chat either since so i i'm only getting where people are putting the questions in the question place so if you click at the top where it says live and uh top chat there's also a question placed there. So I'm getting okay. some questions in there. All right. Um, uh, Brian saying pesticides destroy the soil life in your garden. I totally agree with you, Brian. And it is why I don't suggest uh, using pesticides, uh, only mm. organic. Um, you know, anything that's organic is fine. Because yeah. at the end of the day, we're all here talking about building soil life, right? I'm working my backside off making compost to bring that life into the garden. I don't want to be killing it with pesticides. You know, no. why would I want to do that? I think sometimes if you've got like a big p a pest infestation, then think about it. Do you, do you just remove that plant? Do you know, do you sacrifice the field for the many? And I've done that before as well. I thought this is so infested, you know, infested now that, can I should I treat it or should I just remove it before it goes to everything else? And another tip that I do as well is if you've got a particular crop that you like, like onions, and you're having problems with allium leaf miner and whatnot, then why do you need it all in one bedroom? I'm gonna like split it up for your plot or your garden, and that's what I'm gonna be on more next year. I'm just I don't know why we have these little compartments. Like I'm a stickler for doing it. Like I have a raised bed, I think, oh, that should be for all cabbages and next year i'm doing more permaculture and i just want to be more you know have more biodiversity but yeah split them up so because i've got two plots now um i've split the onions and the garlic up on either plot so if i do have an infestation and they eradicate it doesn't take out the whole bed i've got the other plot and yeah you know the pieces on the plot as well yeah so cartoon 80s and 90s it says any suggestion on to deal with grubs and raised beds is pretty much exactly what we yeah. were just talking about so uh just treat them exactly the same as if you would with anything else Pam my Clark, chickens my chickens do a lot of you know work and you probably do the same tony like they yeah. every now and again you know in the summer i'll just let them out and the the good yeah. thing about the raised beds it does actually deter them a little bit from pop you know hopping in they will still will but they're more concentrate on the bark pass and whatnot but they will pop in and they will rummage around as long as you keep an eye on they're not eating the crops or whatnot then they tend to they tend yeah. to take a lot of bugs out as well yeah just keep them away from the salad beds yeah oh, yeah <laughs> i had this pristine salad bed last year right i'm not joking you every lettuce and it was pristine <laughs> and i let the chickens out one day and i forgot all about it I come back it was massacred the whole bed was just flat to the ground it was like oh no yeah you <laughs> can't you can't be angry more though, seeds well, you know look, they, they had a good they feed can... didn't they they did yeah 
Uh, Pam Clark's asking uh, if DE oh, will Pam. help with Flea Beetle. Um, it will. I. There are so many other things that you can use with Flea Beetle, Pam. Um, like I said, get across into our article. I've covered everything in there. But DE will help with Flea Beetle. But you're better off with things like yellow pads and st sticky pads and things like that. Yeah. Pam. Okay. Uh, what's your go-to companion plants for the plot and where do you plant them amongst the beds? I'm looking at ordering my seeds. My wife's buying my seeds for Christmas. That's from Adam. Oh, Heath. Nice of it. <laughs> um, like I, again, like I normally plant everything in one particular bed and that would be my cabbages, my onions, stuff like that. And it, 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 it just doesn't work. It just doesn't work right. Like it looks nice. And my plot will look Instagram worthy because it'll be a nice big bed of cabbages, and then there'll be one of onions. But it's just not real. It's just not realistic. So yeah, um, I I have done the onions surrounding cab um, carrots and things like that. So I I have done that. But yeah, like I said before, like my runner beans. That's one of the things I'll never change. Like I, my runner beans, I always plant at the top of my plot, and then I've got an archway which had nasturtiums on and. They just decimated the nasturtium. They looked horrific, but I didn't care because I didn't have I didn't have no pest on my runner beans this year. Absolutely yeah. not. So I had I and had nasturtiums really good are great for that because they um, they prefer to chew down on them yeah. rather than the beans. And at the end of the day, that's what we're growing them for in in a vegetable garden, right? So you know, yeah, um, it, was, it was a bit of a toss up. Do I put this? Do I put this nasturtium covered in black fly right at the front of my plot? But I wanted the beans, and I I done none. So yeah, plant nasturtiums all the way. But be careful because they can self seed and they can become a pest as well. But yeah, um, I have no problem with them. So um, right, I'm going to let you have an answer on this one. Quiet space. Any help on white tomato plants in hydroponics? Uh, going curling down leaves in yellow, yet flesh uh, fresh nutrients, and with Mars Hydro lights. God, Steve um, Digwell would be the best one for this, not me. <laughs> well, you're you're the one here answering the no, questions, I, pal. I have to be completely honest. I've never used hydroponics. Maybe one day I will, but I I have no knowledge at all about hydroponics. But yeah. Okay, so what would you think about the uh, the the curling of tomato leaves and yellowing? Because whether it's hydro or soil, the 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 thing is pretty much the same, isn't it? So. You know, it, it's down to uh, various stuff. So, what would you think that would be then? Yellow. Oh, Tony, totally stop being to... mean now. Um, well, I'm like... just trying to. <laughs> You're trying to be. For some reason, my search has stopped working on the in on the yeah. internet. You carry on a minute while I'm trying to get something up. No, that's not. <laughs> um... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh, this no, is we like catching you out, question. Question. Are we? You don't get this on my lives. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know, um, they, they've come to ask you, haven't they? They haven't come to ask me at all. They come to ask us. Um, yeah, so leaf curling again. Like I, I have had it, and it can be down to the fact that you know, is it perhaps it's overwatered? Like I don't know. Hydroponics is it's just something I just don't know nothing about. Absolutely nothing. Maybe I need someone to teach me something on hydroponics. Right, okay, bear me a second. I'm just doing a search on my <laughs> website for it because my search bar isn't working. So Steve and, did uh, well, thanks, Steve. You saved me here. He said that it could be um, down to the lack of nutrients in the hydroponics, and they might they need a very balanced mix. So I knew you'd help me out there, Steve, because Steve's a bit of a whiz on those type of things. I, yeah. I like to grow things in soil. I know it looks nice in all these hydroponics, but I like to put my hands in that dirt and plant things i don't want nutrients washing around in in fluid to feed my plants i'm too traditional yeah. for that i'll go well, to no dig and that's as far as i'm going well do you know the funny thing is it's like i think what you'll find is um you will eventually try yeah you know, try some form of uh aquaponic or hydroponic you know and mm -hmm. um I'm still looking for this post while I'm doing it because I know I have that exact article. Like um, there's an actual well, like Chinese restaurant um, a couple of miles from me, and they grow all their greens 
for their restaurant, hydroponics. I thought it was fantastic. You know, it was all tubed in there, like a conservatory style building. And it was fantastic. But to mm. me, that to me, it looks really futuristic to be growing it like that. And I don't know. It, hey, it, I'll try it. I will try forward. it. It may be that that's the way life is going to have to go if we're running out of know, land. And stuff. Who knows? Isn't it, I, like, you know? I like the fact that, you know, I believe that we were put on this earth to put things in the ground and put your hands in the dirt. So I'll try it, but I, I can't see me swaying from it, I'm afraid. <laughs> I can't get my search bar working for some reason on the website. So I can't even find this bloody... Um... Let's have a look at some of the other this questions. Thing. I can find someone that's not a bit yeah. old. Try to be nice to the questions, God. Well, I can only I can only give you all the guys that want to know the answers to, pal. I'm just going <laughs> to say hello to a few people that I know. So, hi, Tamsin. And I'd see, also seen earlier Amelia and Rob. And, yeah. Uh, I'm still trying to find this guy, sorry, bear with me one second and then I'll come back and because um, I know I've got a year somewhere. So Steve also said that is a lack of potassium can also cause potassium leaf peeling. Cause it. Yeah, right. I've actually found it. Um, okay, so here is that link, guys. Um, and um, that will explain... Uh, break it down for you yeah potassium um they can curl even down from something as simple as cold weather if we're having like a, if they get a bit shocked overnight uh those yeah. sort of things um uh they they'll curl through lack of water so if you're inconsistent in watering um but it's mainly down to nutrition um but when we say nutrition it doesn't mean that there's not enough nutrition in the ground it could be that because you were inconsistently watering all the little fine hairs and fine roots that are the feeder roots have all yeah. withered and died and now you only have like the, the the roots that are actually um holding the plant in situ so what you would need to do at that point is then give a foliar spray until those roots regrow yeah. but the best way to combat this is to have consistent watering but not too much because overwatering can cause it as well I've still got, I've actually got a tomato plant that self-seeded from obviously a tomato that's dropped down in the last month or two. And I went over there yesterday or the day before, and it's about two foot high. And even though it was minus four in the greenhouse, it's, it looked it looked fine. Like, I know it's going to die off, but I, a part of me thought, should I bring it home? But I thought, oh God, am I holding on to a tomato plant for Christmas? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? But yeah, for some reason, this tomato... It's holding on, even though we've all this frost as well, and it doesn't, it doesn't yeah, die yet. And, and that's the thing, like you know, you the the problem you have is where do you stop? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Do you do you just keep going um, until um, you know until someone says, "Oh well, you know, it's um, it's you know it's still growing," but then the, the yeah. problem you have is then something like blight will come in and then you've got to deal with that within the, the greenhouse and you've got other stuff yeah. that's in there as well that's winter and stuff so you know you just have to sort of weigh it up you know right so the next question we got um we go. <laughs> is from uh bear with me where are we it's from matthew bradbury and he's saying, Tony, how do I sort spider mite in the greenhouse? They yeah, got Tony. my regimes this year. And this is coming from Lisa. Now, uh, Lisa is the young lady who challenged me to a pumpkin grow Yeah, I remember. And um, she's, uh, she's, so she's having a few problems with spider mites. Um, yeah. <laughs> I will put a blog in the chat for Lisa. But what, have you got anything to add to it? I have. I tend to always like spray my. I've only ever out twice, and I sprayed the water, and I also, I bought like an insecticidal soap, and it, that worked perfectly for it. That's the only two things, I, I did to be honest. But insecticidal soap worked amazing for the um the spider mites. But I just yeah. kept hosing them off, and they just, it worked in the end. It's just persistence, yeah, you know. Mean... Just keep... That's what it is with them, right? Uh, you need to, first off, you need to spot them. You need to know they're yeah. there. 
All right. That's the biggest issue for um, a lot of people uh, with them because they see the plant is doing something, but then they think, oh, this my plant, it must be down to nutrition or something. But spider mites can cause a lot of the same things like the mm -hmm. yellow patches on leaves and stuff like that. Right. But again, washing them off, insecticidal soaps are really good, um, you know, and uh, if you catch them early enough, you might even be able to rub them off because if you see them on just like one or two leaves, you can just cut that leaf and take it away yeah. and I'm done with it, you know? But this is where it's important. Get a magnifying glass and check out your leaves. If you start seeing any leaf starting to turn colour or anything like that, that's probably a sign of it. I've got... So will, they, um, will, they over, will they overwinter, Tony, in the greenhouse? Like, well, because I've seen other people like putting those bug bombs and things in the greenhouse and I, I yeah. don't know about that. <laughs> the, well, I mean, spider mite, right? I mean, you might have even had them in the poultry and stuff, mm. right? So um, those, like, so those of us who use poultry manure, the spider yeah. mites can actually stay alive within that poultry manure, and then you're adding it to your greenhouse or your gardens, things yeah. like that, right? Um, th this cold weather will probably sort a lot of it out, but not all of it. Again, you can use things like the yellow sticky pads and what have you. Um, but you know, it is it is what it is. Now, Lisa, if you go to my website on that um, on that blog post that's on the screen at the moment. And that will help you with dealing with spider mites, okay? And um, tell your mum and dad to to follow that. There is some uh, things in there about cleaning out and everything else. Yeah. But you can you can effectively get rid of them quite easily. You just like need seen to stay on top of them. Rob's a lot mentioned about the bug bombs, but yeah, like the only issue about those is that you could kill everything else off in there then as well. That. <laughs> A lot Massive. of the bug bombs tend to be sulfur-based as well, and uh, you know, and this mm. stuff is sitting on your ground, and yeah. I don't, I don't like them personally, you know. But you know, mm -hmm. it's each to their own. At the end of the day, if you know, if you can't eradicate them, um, then you've got to do something get, because you're not getting any any um, veg anyway, are you? Because they just no, no, no that's it. Uh, Rose life, not a question, but now that neem oil is banned in the UK, rosemary oil is an effective alternative. Oh, so that's good. that's good. And funny enough, my missus uses rosemary oil for her hair because it's supposed to help with hair growth as well. Huh. So so it seems to have a lot of uh, of good benefits. I, I thought we'd get a lot more slug questions. <laughs> I really thought we would because that's... Oh, you thought to... you were going to have a, an easy day. No, I didn't think I'd have an easy <laughs> But I thought I that's normally where people talk about pests. They always tack every live with slugs. And for some reason, <laughs> if you hey, like you can't say you wasn't warned. <laughs> <laughs> they need to throw anything into this thing. God, they'd be bringing out some Australian spider kangaroo something before. And I'm like... So Brian was asking <laughs> if there's any jumping worms in the UK. No, Brian, we don't have them. In fact, we spoke about them uh, last week when we had... Um, uh what's his name from those names gone up my head oh my god who's this I now? Gone blank last week's guest marty marty yeah marty um marty came over and we we were talking about composting worms and stuff and mm. uh he uh we were talking about them then on, on that live, but um, we don't have them here in the UK or no. not that I'm aware of anyway. I uh, think the issue that we get though is that when when we're trying to problem solve something, we might be making the problem 10 times worse. It's like you can put diatomaceous earth, um, earth around plants and things and they'll stop slugs and because the, they don't like the sharpness, but then the worms don't like it either and then you're pulling that into the soil and there's always that one thing that you could you need to be careful that you're not making it worse by even like putting pesticides down like the, i don't you know the single most important thing that you could probably do for your garden is to build a pond and i know it sounds yeah. mad but the pond brings in wildlife which will help you control those pests and over time they it becomes a fine balance um a pond really does make a difference uh pauline morris is asking if you can make your own sticky pads i'm sure now, i'm sure you can <laughs> pauline i mean if people have used double-sided tape and everything else 
But um, if you can get hold of yellow double-sided tape, then I don't see why not. Because the, the a lot of these pests are attracted to the colour yellow. So yeah. um, so making white ones, they probably would catch them, but um, it wouldn't be as effective. Okay. Pam Clark is asking, uh, do you think this extra cold snap will reduce the pest a bit? Yes. <laughs> and we've all been waiting for it. Um, <laughs> but the issue that I've got is, is that... Ha- uh, because we've had this such warm snap and now we've got it the cold, is this going to prolong into our next year growing season? And that's that's the worry I'm having because I think that whenever we've done this before in the past, we've had a really cold, really cold winter and it's been a long dragged out one. And if you notice, we had a really dragged out spring this year, dragged out summer. Is Are we now going to have a dragged out winter where normally we're the first as gardeners trying to grow those tomatoes and get them out early yeah. and you get excited about putting beans out early and are we going to be waiting till you know middle of spring i'm actually holding out? off for a lot of my stuff this Same. year purposely because um last year and the year before we had those really cold spells in like the end of february and yeah. most of march into the beginning of april and um and then we've got like two foot chili plants sat in a room you know trying to keep lights on well i'm already i was telling danny earlier on guys i've put 400 pounds into the utilities Mm -hmm. here this month in the last 17 days it's crazy um but i'm roll. i'm 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 can't wait for february to come when they've come in and install my solar so um but yeah. going back to this you know i i want to be able to hold off a little bit because for every week that i haven't got to put extra lighting on because i've already got it for all the plants in here but i ain't going to be sowing those in here yeah. and risk you know damaging my house plants do you know what i'm saying i so, think a lot um, of people this you know next year now will be not using their grow lights as much and you know, I think you know we have we have got lazy with them. Like we do rely on them to just get us a quicker harvest. But I think this year, I just I'm predicting that we're going to have a knock on effect where we just got to be patient rather than I'm going to be doing the same like normally. You know, after Christmas, I'm already thinking about my tomatoes, and then a month or so later, I'm putting yeah. them in. But I'm holding back. I'm really going to hold back. And most things will catch up. Things like chilies that need a long season, you're going to have to sow, right? Yeah. Um, but tomatoes, you can plant tomatoes in April and still have them catch up with everybody yeah, exactly. else's in no time at all because it's warmer. They get through the seedling phases quicker. You know, I mean, um, you know, and pests. Talking tomatoes, what about tomato homeworm? Don't you dare. I don't. <laughs> 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 so i named this title well then for tips from the professionals <laughs> you, you named i think i've done pretty well there's been about 20 pests they've thrown at me god <laughs> but you know picked about... a subject yeah but ho- hornworm <laughs> yes hornworms smarter hornworms again i've got an article on it guys i've never um, had problems no. about hornworms so i don't know i can only deal with problems that have arisen i don't research <laughs> problems i've never had <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that one in there for you. Yeah, it you wasn't did. a question we've had. <laughs> right. Um, so Jangzi's asking, does diatomaceous earth hurt worms? It can do. So um, that's where Danny was bringing up earlier on that mm. uh, you need to be careful in what you're doing because you can put DM down um, and it will sort one problem out, but invariably it's going to create another, right? So you've just got to really think about what you're doing and why you're doing it, okay? If you find that you've got a piece of garden that doesn't have much life below that ground because it's really poor soil and things like that, yeah. or you're putting it onto maybe potted plants, right? Then it's not really a problem because the earthworms aren't in those potted plants. So then you can do it there, you know. But just think about where you're using things like DM and um, uh, DE and stuff, right? So yeah. Um, and like I, way. I don't know. I, I don't actually know why this happened. But this year, I, I did a trial, and I don't know why it happened. But I, lay, I mulched a whole bed, a, a one whole bed with um, cocoa coir, and that was only purely because. I bought it really cheap and I want I needed something to mulch one of the beds. And I planted my beans directly into that soil. And for some reason, slugs hated it. 
I had slug trails all around the bed. And for some reason, that cocoa coir, even though it can keep moisture in, for some reason, they just didn't They just didn't want to cross yeah. that. And I know it's because it, it's uneven and stuff, but... Yeah. And again, it might have been a pH issue, issue there as well yeah. at some point. You just don't know, do you? But they just, they um, hate, they actually, and I had perfect beans from them, from that bed as well. Yeah, yeah. So, Rules Life's asking, Tony, what's the difference between aquaponic and hydroponic? Uh, so, we've got hydro, which is water-based uh, growing, where you would put chemical uh, into the water, and uh, you'd have like a vat of water you're adding nutrients to, and it would grow from uh, this many different forms of hydro. Aquaponic is when you're using fish and the filtration or the the uh, ammonia that the fish produces whilst feeding the plants, and it tends to go through a flood and an ebb uh, system. So uh, that's that's the difference. Is fish involved? Um, move that. Uh, Question, what's the best way to get rid of your wigs? They decimated my tomatillos this year. Yeah, they they're another thing as well that I had whenever I had my um my chili plants and and obviously tomatillos and tomatoes as well in the greenhouse, it's that habitat for a minute. And I again I I found that they don't like cinnamon. I don't know why it is about this magic cinnamon, but they just they hated it. And but I this year. I didn't have as much. I don't know why I planted my chilies. I broke the rules. I plant the chilies directly into the soil. And I don't know whether it was sheltered. I don't know. But they, they stayed up again. Like Yuri Wigs, I always use cinnamon from and they, they yeah. just hated it. I grow uh, all of my chilies in the soil this year. No problems at all. Yeah. Um, one really good tip I can give you for your wigs is to get a clay pot and put some hessian sack in the clay pot and hang that upside down on a three foot cane in amongst yeah. your plants. And all the earwigs will go to that. And in the morning, you could just take that away, Ooh. walk away from your garden, shake out the hessian. They're all gone. They're still alive, but they're not on your garden anymore. Yeah. And that's probably one of the best ways to uh, to catch hold of uh, I know they, they like actually that. hate um, like Vaseline as well. So I've done that before where I've just put Vaseline on my chili pots and stuff. And they, they hated that. And if, even if they did go towards it, they're stuck there then as well. And I've managed to be able to take them off. And they went and lived on so, a farm somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's it now. So Andy's asking, uh, are you saying the Krathke method will work on, uh, for tomatoes? Have you heard of that <laughs> yeah. method? I'm yeah. saying that I'm saying that, that method definitely works. Yeah, come on, all these people works. watching your channel, <laughs> they're all scientists. <laughs> hey, it is what it is, pal. You were on your one day. I gotta do it every week. <laughs> right. So Rue's life. I asked about slugs, uh, but in the chat, so you didn't see it. Um so, oh, go on. The chat just isn't updated. Yeah, I think it's, YouTube it's, must be having a problem. So Joe, there's nothing is, in the chat, I don't go on. No, Joe's Fisasian is asking what Hessian is. So Hessian is like you know, those like old fashioned burlap like, burlap sacks, basically. Yeah. yeah, burlap. Um, so uh Rui, if you can put your question back in about slugs um, so that we can answer that because <laughs> we're not getting, I don't know what's gone wrong with YouTube, but we're not getting their chat anymore. Okay. Um, let's remove that one. Um, Karen Shields, is all leaf miner the same? Mine is in the Swiss chard making lines on the leaf. So you can eat it. Yeah, treat them all identically. Yeah. You get them for different plants, but they're all pretty much exactly the same and treating them is the same. Okay. Uh, Pam, uh, Garden of Weed, and I've never used grow lights. So Pam has grown and never used a grow light. Yeah. I, What's your thoughts I on actually, that? I actually seen a few last year that ditched their grow lights and... I am tempted, I was tempted not to this year coming up. Well, you know, start the next year, but look at him. <laughs> I'm surprised the SWAT team haven't come through those windows, honestly. What's he growing in there? I'm surprised someone haven't phoned it through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, like I I think you can't, you know, there there is a benefit to them if you want to have things growing quicker like obviously like chilies they need a long season but tomatoes i think we we just got used to using them now and i think it's just yeah. one of those things if you've got a hobby you try and 
you're just impatient. The most, most we want to extend the season, don't we? Right? And, what we want to do, but, but the thing is, sometimes, yeah, but sometimes, like I say, when you've got a cost of living crisis and everything else, well, you know, you, if you get tomatoes another month later, so be it. You know, it's not that important. Yeah. I um, won't be growing like, mine. I've got. Life. I've got these grow lights here. The, every single light that's on in here at the moment are all um, very low, uh, very efficient LEDs. Um, they're not like the Mars Hydros or the Spider Pharma lights. They're all yeah. packed away. I'm not using those. Um, but these, the, the plants in here, there's thousands of pounds worth of plants in here. I can't afford to not give them the light. So you know yeah. do i pay for the electric and keep them alive or do i lose the plant so it is what it is you know i think i think like personally myself i think we are in a crisis so if if i was at weight if i'm outweighing my yield of tomatoes cost over how much it's going to you know cost for me to grow them early it doesn't it doesn't balance out so this year well next year i'm going to be really patient and i'm going to wait out and i i I bought that really expensive grow light system last um yeah last year and i thought oh that'll last me out forever but i, I can't afford to put it on now <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the thing you know when you consider right i mean you can garden for free right you can get given seeds you can get given old mm. tools you can get a bit of land and you just garden and if we didn't have all of these lights and everything else, that's what we would do, you know? Yeah. Um, I think we've been spoilt to some extent over Absolutely. years. I mean, I've got a walk-in tent. It's like eight feet long, four feet deep, and eight feet high. The kids are in there keeping right? warm right now. And, and, and the thing is, that's my grow tent. I had it in here, and it filled this mm. room pretty much. Yeah. But I can't, like... I wouldn't be able to use this as a studio if I had it set no. up. So, you know, although I've got that, I, you know, I'm not going to set it up this year because of the cost of the electric and everything else, Absolutely. you know? Right. And I think uh, so you, add, have to, you have to weigh it, don't you? Like, and I think with being, us being content creators and we show everyone what we're doing, sometimes I think, we, you know, are we influencing too much sometimes, you know, where we say, oh, we're doing that, so we should do that as well. And, and I fall into that trap, do you know what I mean? But I think this year... You know, coming up, I think we need to be a bit more thrifty. The as danger well because... is that um, you know you get companies uh, wanting their product promoted, and they give people yeah. free products, and people feel obligated. Um, for me, that's never been a, a major thing, but you always see it with grow lights, right? Um, yeah. and, and don't get me wrong, I've um, you know I've advertised grow lights, but only because I think they're good lights, right? Not because. Yeah you know, the company has asked me or anything. And in fact, I've turned down um, Mars Hydro I do many times. Not I think the lights are bad. It's just that I already had a load of Spider Pharma lights. I don't need any more lights. Yeah. So why why bother do the video? I don't need to do the video because people know about them, you know? Yeah. So, um, so I think what you find is, like, we, we're going a bit off topic here, but... Um, you know, but people will need to sort of hold off a little bit. And I don't think it's a bad thing because going back to the pest side of things, I think mm. this cold weather is going to be in, even though it's going to warm up a little bit towards Christmas, I think we're going to have a really cold February and March. And, I agree, actually agree. And, and and that's why I'm holding off. That's where we were going with this. My advice is uh, to save your money and spend it on fleece because that's what you're going to need. Uh, extra blankets. Grow light. <laughs> Like to all men, you have a little blanket. <laughs> we're supposed to be YouTubers living in hey, the Bahamas. If, no, if, they, if they saw me this morning sat in here, it was oh, freezing because our radio, like our Alps, radio went off. Um, so Adam Heath is um, saying climate's warming and we're experiencing drier, also wetter spells. I totally agree with you. Struggling plants attract pests. Uh, do you think our variety choice becoming ever more important? So you are right in what you're saying. Yes, we're becoming uh, warmer and wetter because of that. Mm. And the seasons are also moving, I think, because before, you know, autumn would have been in like October. Yeah. We'd be in the middle of winter now, but winter's only now really starting. So yeah. we're a little bit late with it. 
and like spring you know i remember going fishing with my father on my birthday 21st of march it was always lovely and warm and everything else yeah now you're, you're wrapped up and you're getting floods and stuff like it's mental but um and you're right again when pests attract weak plants right and this is where i think with people rushing with the lights and stuff the plant is grown inside under all these lovely conditions and then we put it out and all of a sudden it's getting that shock factor Ooh. because it's been put out into a temperature yeah. that mm. it wasn't used to that makes that plant go into shock becomes weak and that's where pests start attacking them right yeah so you know um i think that variety is going to be important because some varieties will do better in the cold and and against pest disease um we already know we've already spoke about like resistor fly carrots and things like that mm -hmm. but there is a trade-off with taste and quality and everything Absolutely. else so you've got to be prepared to say well i'm i'm happy to have a bland carrot i just want a carrot or no. Do I risk losing them and sow some more to make sure I get a harvest? Yeah. You know, and take some other steps to prevent those pests, right? So um, the danger you have is when you're going, oh, well, we'll only grow these varieties because they're good against pests. But then what happens when those pests evolve? And all of a sudden then we've limited the pool of varieties we can use. Yeah. So, you know, there, there is always a danger there. Dare I say it, though? The best, you know, you need to go back to the soil. And I know you're going to love that part I've said that, but you do. You know, if you've got healthy soil and you're not pest, you know, putting pesticides in it. It keeps a strong plant. It's well fed and it can fight off those things. And also, I think we we plant things out too early as well. You know, we, we get so excited about this little seedling. Plant it out bigger. You know, like I've potting on is the best thing as well, because the bigger the plant... If you have a, an infestation of something, that plant's got a chance to fight it off better than a tiny little seedling because we're just too excited to put it out, you know, and you end up with nothing. So just keep popping on. And, you know, I put a cabbage up once this big and it became this big because it just it could fight off everything. Honestly, it was a tough nut. <laughs> like my big 67 pounder. It so up the valley somewhere, I'm sure. Shameless plug, go. guys. <laughs> right. <laughs> This book will, will basically talk to you about all the microbial life and why it's important and what really goes on under your feet. It's Although it's named Composting Masterclass, this is mainly talks about uh, like microbial life farming, if you like, um, why, why that's important around composting. So what I will say to you guys, um, if you haven't already, I'll put a link on the screen in a moment as soon as i can find it because i know i've got it here somewhere um do you know what i don't know if i have the link here i'll put the link in the in fact the link is in the description guys so um go and have a look at that oh so we seem to be getting a few facebook members coming through uh on the chat but i'm not getting any YouTube yeah, it's, it's, stuff. for some reason it's all facebook in our chat yeah but, um i can see all the questions as well on my but yeah, it's it's like what so, Jane Kelly just said now, you know, like Crimson Crush. I know I didn't mind Crimson Crush this year. I find it bland know, though. Muddy Boots loves them and I mm. do like them, but they're not as good. You know, I, I'd sooner have 50 pests in the greenhouse and get that beautiful tomato out. out even if it's even if 50 have been killed off or something, it's worth it, I think. And plus, if we didn't have no pests, would we not be bored though? If if it was literally the most pristine you know garden nothing was challenging us we'd be bored it wouldn't be a hobby then Look, because we have the, nothing to do the country is fr throwing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of tons of food away every year because it's not perfect shape or yeah. the right color or whatever the case being right and the problem is that gardeners very similar in that they want things to look right and they want it to look all really nice, but then it, there's a cost of taste. <laughs> Give me a sun gold tomato over any other tomato. Oh, absolutely. Because the flavor in that tomato is just immense. And I couldn't care less if it came out like a figure eight, right? As long as it tastes like that, I wouldn't care. Um, you know, and, if, so, and if we're so really good. honest, like I, YouTubers will always show that best carrot. Do you know what I mean? 
And yeah, of course, you know, we all do I'm it. I'm not saying That's... I've ever done this, but I know other YouTubers, which I will mention, to pull carrots back out in and out of the bed to get the perfect shot, Jane Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> but she'll, you know. <laughs> But yeah, but I mean, we do show our best harvest because that's what people want to see. But the reality is, we all get wonky carrots. We all get, you know, potatoes that are a bit rubbish. But that's the fun of gardening, and that's why well, I look at my potato I, harvest this year. And I'm known for growing potatoes, you know. But yeah, like I wanted to do some we, trials. Like we will show our fail failures, and I always Absolutely. do. I know you do as well. And I think that's more realistic. Like you can show the perfect you know garden with no weeds and no pests and no trouble but people don't really want to like see that. that because they feel like a failure when they're watching them because they think why are they getting it all right and we're getting it wrong so I they must love learned. watching my gardening because it's always like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> right well, okay this is why i had the extra allotment because every, that wasn't just the main reason but everyone was saying oh look so i always look so pristine on YouTube well, you've got to have your Instagram photos, haven't you? <laughs> and I do have right. my Instagram photos. I mean, you, if you so, look at my Instagram, I think, God, he knows his stuff. And then you look at my new plot, and it's, it's a realistic plot. You know, I'm going to have weeds there, and I'm going to be, yeah. you know, getting a bit annoyed. My other plot, I did foresee all the problems, and I did try and eliminate some before I, you know, I started the channel. So that's why they didn't see it. But I do get a lot of those comments saying, I wish I had one like yours. I'm like, you don't, that because... It, just it takes, takes time. time, and yeah. that was my only issue with um, my channel. Is I started pretty much at the finish line, where I'd eradicated all the brambles and the weeds and the pests, mm -hmm. you know, that I had, and then I showed this like pristine garden, and it was. It, now I'm showing you, like, no, this is where you go. You do have to dig a no dig garden at the start because you will get those brambles and those yeah. stingy nettles, and they do. We're got, going off subject, you know. We're always going to be right. So we? Rue was saying uh, she's uh, never used lights and uh, always gets good crops, and and you know that's great. So how do you both deal with slugs and snails? Yay, we got a slug question. <laughs> <laughs> no, Off just, you go, then, Danny. <laughs> I'm not a slug specialist, Jeremy, you know I because I actually do. Well, I actually this is one thing. Hang on, I think I got you actually. So. I am known, renowned for being a weirdo at my plot because I turn up with this on my head most most evenings in the summer after a shift at the hospital. And I'm there looking for slugs. And then I've got this other one there, which is like UV, and it looks for the beetles and stuff. I got a torch for everything, honestly. But I do go up there, and that's the thing. Be patient. Go up there after dark. Leave traps for them. But, you know, planks of wood and things that they can hide under. And then they'll be there, especially when you go home. Go back up and spend that extra 10 minutes or so just going through and you'll be shocked what comes out and visits your plot at night. Usually yeah. people like me and with torches. <laughs> yeah. Um, so. Another really good end is uh, obviously uh, there's a few things. First off, attracting the birds, you know, the, you know, all of the other things that would use slugs like hedgehogs and things like that, mm. get them eating them. Um Upturned grapefruit is a really good one. So if yeah. you if you have grapefruit for breakfast or anything like that, keep the shells, turn them upside down, and in the morning you will find hundreds underneath them. Yeah. Um, Another thing is rhubarb leaves as well. Like that's like a really yeah. old fashioned tradition. I love that one. You know, not before you need to keep, you know, the leaves for, you know, putting nutrients back into the, you know, into the plant, but. Any extra rhubarb leaves that I've cut off, I, I will put them on beds and things. And it mulches, but it also, those slugs will hide into them and you can just use them. And you use them like a like a piece of paper and put them all in, wrap it up, and off yeah, they go. Yeah. And I think, again, with slugs, you know, I mean, nematodes are one that I'm a big fan of. And I make my own yeah. uh, because they're so expensive to buy, especially oh, on the scale that I'm gardening, you know. Um, I spend a fortune on nematodes every year. Yeah. But I do yeah. think it's worth it because, oh. Well, it's each to your own, isn't it, right? Because, like, gardening's our hobby. If we were golfers, mm. we'd go and spend a fortune on a new club. Absolutely. Right? So it doesn't matter what hobby you have. There is a <clears> cost involved in that hobby. Um, and we just happen to get food out of the end of ours. Like, you know, um, yeah. so I never, ever, like, I will, I will spend a fair bit of money on my garden because it's really my only vice. I have a little drink now and then, but you know, it's my only vice. I don't smoke. I don't, you know, I don't tend yeah. to go out a lot. So 
my garden is where I spend my money. And uh, no, I, I will never apologize for that. No. Um, have you reached equilibrium between beneficial and harmful insects? If so, how many years of natural gardening is expected to reach reach this balance? I'm not far from it because mm. usually when um, I get, to be honest with you, I can't remember the last time I've had an infestation of anything. No, it's I been a long time. But like if like the roses had um, some aphid come in on them uh, this year early and within like, three or four days a load of lace wings came in and just eradicated them out um mm. but if i like panicked and saw you know three days earlier and started spraying them down and everything else exactly. you're just creating a problem you know um and there's certain things you can't do like my biggest bugbear was wireworm and th yeah the, you had the, the, like a, a little worm that bores into potatoes it ruins them and everything else which mm -hmm. is what started me growing them in the containers in the first place yeah um, and but you just change your method and it eradicates the problem like that i probably haven't even got wire worm in my ground anymore because there's never been any tube, any potato tubers there for them to to get into but i've not yeah. obviously I've not tried because it's been what 13 years that I've not been growing in the containers now. So, you know, um, but you, you just find your, you know, you just do what you need to do. You alter your growing habits and you bring in the wildlife and everything else. And eventually it will balance out because at the end of the day, nature always finds its balance, right? You know, Absolutely. if we let the garden to just do its own thing, plants will grow. Pests will come in. The predecessors will come in behind them, and the plant and the plants will grow again next year. Yeah, uh, you know, at the end of the day, nature sorts itself out. We just keep interfering with it. I think gardeners they're the worst worst things for a garden, really, because we mother things too much. And I think because we're you know like you constantly watering and stuff. And I mean, I I watered one bed this year, and I watered another, and I didn't water a bed as much. And I found the bed that wasn't watered as much. It, it didn't make no difference. Like, I actually found the one with less water had better crops from it because we're making them weaker and we're making them lazy and they're not doing what and, they're supposed to do. Like we're And this is why I them. say always water deeply, fewer yeah. times a week, because that forces the root system down mm -hmm. looking for that water, which makes a stronger plant, which is less susceptible to pests. Uh, yeah. Rose Life is saying, don't you think that the average everyday gardener uh, does just grow with basic tools and a bit of land or a garden. Yeah, I, I, like mm. for most part. Um, but, you know, when you have the the thing of greenhouses, polytunnels, sheds and stuff like that, um, you know, you can spend money if you want to. You don't yeah. have to. That's the thing here, you know. Um, like you don't have to spend money to be a golfer because you can pick up a second and set of golf clubs from somebody and probably even free mm. or marketplace or something and you can play with them but the problem is as you get better you want better clubs you know and that's and, exactly what happens yeah gardeners get that's bored don't we and we we want to try the new hoe and we want to you know it's not that we're compete we're competing with the garden next door but i you do one you do want to like i do anyway i i'm forever looking for not so much the next best thing but I mean, if something makes it easier for me, I mean, I work in a hospital and, you know, we both work on that that side where we're forever, you know, as like Tony, yeah. you're a fireman, you know, and we're constantly, our time is precious. And that's the yeah. difference with uh, me as a gardener is that and if I can save myself 20 minutes a day by not having to weed or not having to be picking slugs off, then I'm going to pay that money because... I don't want to be doing that. Like my time is really valuable because I'm forever in work and shifts. And yeah. yeah, but you, like you said, you can spend it if you want to. And and I think, I don't think you should be pressurized into buying anything that you don't want to buy or, and it don't make you a better gardener. It just give, it just makes you an easier gardener to do things. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, Rue's just saying that she likes all her wonky veg and Pam was saying she saw a cauliflower for £2.50 is crazy. Um, major dog 23 how do i get rid of sawfly um the easiest way to deal with sawfly is to cut out all of the uh center of mm -hmm. any plant so if yeah. it's like gooseberries for argument's sake is 
build it like a goblet shape they don't like yeah. air movement all right so the more airflow you can give a plant that's how you're going to deal with sore fly um you can wash them off and everything else just like everything we've spoken about but airflow is the is the main key thing for sore fly uh cut your your uh, bushes into a goblet shape so that yeah. it get in the center of them they won't like that therefore they won't lay their eggs there okay uh Let's get rid of that one. Rich, uh, Tony, I have a major deer problem. How can I deter them without spending a fortune on new fences or shooting the, the, the deer? <laughs> <sighs> well, look, um, <laughs> there are certain pests that, unfortunately, <laughs> fences are going to be the only way that you're going to stop mm. them. Um, uh, and it's going to be a cost to you, Rich, unfortunately. Um, you know, you're not going to be... I mean, you could get these um like geo fences now they have um which are uh, you know they um it's just like a single electric line they don't need to wear a tag for them uh like most uh geo fences are designed to keep things in not out um but there is one now that um it's just like a electric line um and that would probably be a cheaper way of doing it. a couple of posts up and and just this one line because as soon as they touch that, they're going to get a shock and they're going to run, yeah. aren't they? Um, that'd probably be the cheapest way, but you, it's got to be some sort, uh, some form of fencing, unfortunately. Rich. Luckily, we don't have to deal with that stuff. We'd be lucky to get a rabbit or a squirrel. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, we had a major issue with rabbits up here um, and you squirrels over the last few years. They're coming from the fields <clears throat> behind the allotments, and um, uh, we ended up um, putting fencing right around the allotment um and then chicken wiring that but mm -hmm. it was a massive job we had to dig down and everything to yeah and stop it's more digging and, it? uh, yeah and you know it went like two feet out away from the it was a it was a massive job but it was the only way to yeah. stop them coming in but that was because I... we you know we got nearly 100 plots and um and people are paying money you've got to you've got to protect that like you know I get loads of questions about squirrels and stuff because sometimes you'll see them on my video, like on the back of the shed, and the, and I actually don't mind them. Like I know that they're coming down and eating things, but I think sometimes you need you need to give a little and protect a lot. But you know, I think you know when you're trying to stop something from eating, you know, I don't, I don't say they should eat the whole harvest, but I mean, if I know a squirrel's coming down, do you know I mean you can't stop a squirrel really because a squirrel can get in any time they want really. You know, unless you yeah. unless you're making steel cages around things, but yeah, I I tend to you've got to you've got to take the hit sometimes, haven't you? And you've just got to take the wins when just you can. grow more than you need, so that exactly. any that you lose, it's not a problem. You still got what yeah. you need. Uh, so, like the last question that's coming in now is from Facebook user. I don't know who you are. Sorry, uh, I find slugs in my polytunnel, which is annoying me. It's more of a comment, really. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean we've spoken about that with the nematodes and everything else. Um, they, they like the polytunnels because of the water that runs down from the condensation. Yeah. And it's nice and moist there for them and and it keeps them out of the environment away from predators. Um, but uh, the secret here now is if you spot any slug eggs, get in there, give it a yeah. good clean out, out, find the slug eggs, and that's going to sort your problem out for next year. Like I have seen other people, and like I'll do it in my polytunnel as well, where they, you know, they hang a a beam down in the middle and they grow their plants tender on them until they're bigger like that's a, a fantastic tip and also like i've done this before where i've had like a, a deep tray and i've had two deep trays and i put like salty water at the bottom two plant pots in the middle and another tray on top and the slugs they won't go into that reservoir to climb up the middle pots because they hate salty water so that saved me so much on yeah on, on little seedlings and things yeah right danny i think that's the end of the questions okay and we're coming up close to the hour and a half anyway yeah. so i'm going to let you um just remind everybody i've put your link to the channel so just remind everybody what they can expect there and then um i'll just do my final words and i'll speak to you in a moment yeah so if you come over to my channel obviously you will i am quite casual with how i garden and i'll show you my successes and failures but i also have a little bit of a giggle as well but i'm quite handy with like gadgets and solar power and things like that and I, i'm quite handy with a saw and a, and a little hatchet as well but yeah 
I'm always forever doing DIY projects and things on my plot as well. So I'm always on the go. If you have, if you've already been on my channel, you will go away having a little giggle as well. So yeah. Great. Okay, we'll see you in a moment, mate. And uh, thanks for coming on and uh, and helping with thanks all these me, questions. Thanks for having me, Tony. All right, we'll see you in a bit. Bye. Right, guys. Well, that's it for uh, this live stream. Hopefully, this um, answers it. And I hope some of you um, uh, have been able to get across to the website. Nothing's been happening right tonight. The the YouTube chat isn't working for some reason. The uh, search bar on my website isn't working for some reason. So I don't know if it's just something my end. Um, but look, you know, we've put the links in the uh, in in the chat for you to go there. But if you are struggling with anything to do with any pests for the garden go to my website which is simplifygardening.com click on the blog and in there you will find pest and disease category and you'll be able to scroll through all the different pests and disease that i've wrote about the era i think it's something like 700 articles on that website now so you should find the article you're looking for now there isn't going to be a live next week because obviously christmas is going to fall on 22nd and i'm going to be way too busy getting stuff sorted i i'm actually off after this tour so i've got four days in now and then i'm off um so uh, i'm going to spend that and have a bit of time with the family over christmas the next live will be on the 29th of December and we've got a guest uh, which is Sean from Chili Chimp and he is coming on and we're going to be talking about all things chili so I hope that you'll enjoy this I'm hoping to get different software sorted for then so hopefully the streams will be a bit more dynamic um, anyway guys I hope you've enjoyed this episode and I will see you in the next one bye bye